The riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense All the songs are b-sides and the cover art's a mess There's so much here to tear apart Listen to it for a week Now that we has passed Why I Hate This Album Podcast With Tim and Garrett Hello and welcome to another episode of Why I Hate This Album. I am one of your hosts, Garrett Harvey. With me as always, co-host extraordinaire Lilo to my stitch, Timothy Richardson. Tim, how the hell you doing, buddy? I'm so angry. Glad to hear it. This is a little bit of a revenge plot on my part. After last week's horrifying Slipknot episode, I thought, what is the one thing that I know for a fact you're going to absolutely hate? And thus we have this week's album. Care to tell the folks what it is? This week, we are doing D. Antwords, Mount Ninji, and The Nice Time Kid, released September 16th, 2016. We're finally getting the South African rap scene. I know all of you have been clamoring for it, or there's a good chance many of you are saying, who? Well, that's what the next hour is all about. I don't want to waste another moment. I think I already know the answer, but let's get into it. Do you hate this album? Oh my god, Garrett. I hate this so much. This entire week has been my own personal nightmare. I would have rather listened to a second Slipknot album. Excellent. That's awesome. You hope and you plan and you try, but you don't know it's going to work out. Uh, To hear that you absolutely had as bad of a time or potentially worse than I expected just warms my heart. Garrett, did you hate this? Tim, this is going to be a tough one. It shouldn't be. It's the worst. I just don't think I do. Oh my God. You are a D Antwoord fan. Okay, hold on. D Antwoord fan. Let me just say, I don't hate this album. However, I never want to hear it again. Not Mm. only do I never want to hear it again, I never want to hear another D Antwoord album. I don't even want to hear the words D Antwoord, but Lord knows we're going to say it a hundred more times over the next hour. This is the first album we've done that I, not once did I listen to this all the way through. I couldn't do it. I had to take breaks. It is tiring. I understand. I empathize with your general hatred, but I think that you're taking a very immature attitude. I don't give a shit what you think. I fucking hate you. I hate this album. I hate this podcast. Well, okay, now we've, I hate now you. We've gotten, now we seem to have turned a corner to personal attacks. That's not going to stop. That is our next podcast, Why I Hate This Friendship. <laughs> we'll get there, friend. Don't personal attacks worry. might turn to physical attacks before this is over. Let's talk about our personal experiences with the Antwoord prior to this magical week. I'll start. For me, I knew them from two things. One, I had seen the music video for Banana Brain. Didn't really have any context for it. I just stumbled upon it, as did apparently 28 million other people, and thought it to be utterly insane, and then kind of forgot about it. Then fame director, now shame director, Neil Blomkamp, known for District 9 and other things that most people don't remember now, decided to make them the stars of a wonderful little movie called called Chappie. Much to the chagrin of him and the surprise of no one, nobody really liked it and they really hated the Antwoord. Had you seen Chappie, Tim? I had, yes. Okay, so you at least knew of their acting prowess. To be honest, the first time I saw Chappie, I don't think I knew who these people were. I thought they were just obnoxious, uh, crazy people. I can actually confirm that fact for you, because you said, what was the deal (laughs) with the two main folks? Are they insane? Are they aliens? Are they CG? They don't look like people. Nope. I want to do something a little different this week, Tim. I actually would like to give your personal history, obviously, aside from the chappy interaction, which I don't think counts because you didn't know what you were looking at and they don't really sing. Granted, some of their songs are in the soundtrack, but why would you know that? I actually got a front row seat to Tim's personal history and introduction to the D Antwoord. We were at a little music festival known as ACL. The year was 2016 and we were in that oh so common situation where there was a, a gap between what we had just gone to go see and what we were waiting to go see. I think in that instance, since it was Band of Horses. So we said, you know what might be a fun festival show is this D Antwoord. And Tim said, well, who's D Antwoord? And I said, remember Chappie? And I could tell immediately you were not thrilled. Being a good sport, we decided to move up and just see what this was all about. Now, have you ever seen those videos on YouTube where a tsunami comes? And at first, the people on shore think that, oh, that looks like a big wave. And then as they come to realize that their demise is quickly encompassing the shoreline, they begin running in utter fear and terror seeking 
taking higher ground. Yes. I don't know that that's true. Seems like you're just playing along, but that's fine. <laughs> I'm sure the listeners will know what I'm talking about. And if not, it's terrifying and will haunt your nightmares. Give it a Google. This is the reaction you had to their very first song. Someone managed to weaponize music and use it against you. This is your kryptonite. You physically backed up, covered your ears like a child, and ran in the other direction. <laughs> I did not care for it. I want to be really clear. We make a lot of jokes here on the show. I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating. This is not hyperbole. Tim actually physically covered his ears and ran away. (laughs) He looked at my girlfriend and said, can we not do this? And so we left and saw some other garbage band. But the point is... That's how I knew that this was going to be such a magical week for the both of us. You because you wanted to contemplate suicide and me because I knew that you were quietly contemplating suicide. Well, the worst part of this whole thing is not only did we attempt to leave and go see something else because I insisted on it, but they were so loud that we couldn't escape it. We didn't leave the concert. That's the problem. There was no escaping. Yeah, we attended that full hour and it was horrible. Much like those poor Filipino people, there was no escape. There was no higher ground for you. You were consumed by the tidal wave that was the ant word. Let's talk a little bit about how this musical experiment, rap, electronic, dance, pop duo came to be. But let's do it a little differently this week. Typically, you like to take us through the history of the band, and I'm going to let you do that. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about our main core band members. Before we start that, we have to say this was a tough one. There's not a ton of detailed information just readily available on these guys. We are currently locked in a labor dispute with our research team. They attempted to unionize earlier this week. Yeah, we brought in scabs, and it turns out when you hire temps, they just don't do nearly as good of a job. They want regular breaks 15 minutes every hour. They want combos in the stack machine, which we tried to describe to them. Combos are disgusting. Don't eat combos, but they want them. The labor dispute continues. So yeah, we had a really hard time putting together the dossier. Not to mention these two seem to have spent a considerable amount of time hiding their identities. I mean, on the level of say a a potential superhero, like I think Peter Parker plays a little more fast and loose than, than these two do on who they actually are. Here's what I was able to gather. And I'd like to start with Ninja, aka Ninji, aka Watkin Tudor Jones. I don't know if Watkin's a common name in South Africa, but that's what he goes by, aka Wadi. If you find him in his hometown of Cape Town, people know him as Wadi, although today he will outright ignore you if you call him that until you call him either Ninja or Ninji. Wadi was born in Johannesburg, September 26, 1974. Grew up on a farm where troubled youths would go. Uh, I believe that there was a small hip-hop group that spent some time there known as the Glue Gang Boys. He attended the Parktown Boys High School, one of the most prestigious high schools in Johannesburg, but left in 1992, one year prior to graduating. He then, since that day, has been a non-stop rapist. He goes on to form his first band, Max Normal, that eh, does okay, then forms Constructus Corporation and creates what I have found described as a three-hour sci-fi rap epic. It's worth noting, aside from the fact that what the hell does that mean, Yolandi, a.k.a. Henri Dutois, or Henri Dutoit, or possibly Henri (laughs) Dutois, was also in this band. Doesn't really see any sort of actual acclaim or sales, so they break up, and then he releases a solo album called The Fantastic Kill. After that, he comes back to the Max Normal name, only this time, Tim, he's MaxNormal.tv. This is 2008, and their whole shtick is he comes out, raps in a suit, and the entire group is characterized as and kind of sold as a motivational business seminar, but in rap form. Is Max Normal a Judge Dredd reference? I don't think so. No? All right. It could be. I don't know. Just is a it? happy coincidence? Is someone called Max Normal and Judge Dredd? Yes. Oh, then it probably is. That kind of brings us up to when they formed D Antwoord. So let me switch back over to Miss Henri Dut. <laughs> T-O-I-T, folks, if you know how to say that, let me know, because I sure as fuck don't. Uh, She's born December 1st, 1984, and is promptly given up by her birth mother, and she is adopted. She's raised in Port Alfred, South Africa, where she attends the St. Dominic's Catholic School till she's 16. Fun fact, her adoptive father was a minister for the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa, and then when she graduates from the St. Dominic's Catholic School, she then goes on to the Lady Grey Arts Academy, before finally meeting up with Ninji, a.k.a. Wadi. That's all I could find, which is terrific sparse. Usually you can find out, you know, what year they had their teeth taken out. So Tim, why don't you talk a little bit about the formation and rise of the D-Antwoord? Ninja, Yolandi, 
whatever. They have like a Jack and Meg White thing going on, I think. Absolutely. As far as I could read, they have one kid together. I'm sure they're delightful parents, but it sounded like they're not still together. It said that yeah, Yolandi, they... specifically not both of them, but Yolandi adopted some sort of Dickensian street urchin in South Africa. That's exactly so, what I have in the notes here. Yeah, good for her. Uh, but, yeah, uh, she's. you're 100% right. Often referred to as South Africa's white stripes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they never got married, but they were in fact a couple for several years, spawning a child named Six who looks exactly like Yolandi, a.k.a. Henri de... Yeah. Somewhere along the way, they decided, hey, you know what? We don't really work as a couple. And they're very sketchy on why that is. The two things that I was able to find was, one, it seemed as though Ninji had a real penchant for banging other people, which is understandable, I guess. And, it's understandable um, for him, but not for anyone else. Because who's right. banging this guy? I do not I'm know. not going to bang him. No, you're not going to bang him. I've tried. Mostly because you're... <laughs> okay. He made it quite clear. Yeah. You, not you're interested not in... I don't have the right haircut, I think, nope. was his main complaint. Well, we can work on that. Hair, <laughs> hair can be cut. We just need to get those bangs in place, buddy. And then the other reason was they could tell that their relationship was deteriorating and they could either stay together as a couple or they could stay together as a band. I would argue they chose poorly. I'm but... sure their child would also argue that. However, by all accounts, when they're not out there doing their d word thing, they're somewhat normal parents. They're still best friends, so they're raising this kid together. They just don't bang anymore. d word begins in the late aughts, and they play fairly frequently around small clubs in South Africa. They scrape together their first album in 2009. It's called SOS, or dollar sign, O dollar sign. These guys hate punctuation more than Portugal the man. Their first album, SOS, well, not to mention every single bit of branding they have where an S should be is a dollar sign. So True. if you hear an S in a word, picture a dollar sign. Yeah. We won't touch on it again. That contains the single Enter the Ninja. The video for that would go on to just get millions and millions of views on YouTube. Based on the strength of those YouTube views, they sign a deal with Interscope in 2010. Right after this, in 2010, they play their first international concert that's at Coachella in front of 40,000 people. Then they go on an international tour. As they're doing this, they record their next release. It's an EP titled Five, and that is released on an Interscope subsidiary. But then they decide to leave Interscope because Interscope wanted them to stop being such offensive weirdos, which right. it's a respectable decision, but I would certainly side with the suits. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I feel like you're just a suit in training, Tim. Yeah, that's the, fair. I completely am on D'Antwort's side here. You knew what you were signing up for. Oh, These absolutely. These fucking weirdos. <laughs> You did leave out one small, very interesting fact. In 2010, they won the MySpace Best Music Video Award. We all remember the MySpace Awards, don't we? Yes. What in the hell is that? Oh, I remember them. I okay. used to attend them. I do not think that they were held in person. That sounds wrong. You where, where was I going? Web of, you've been caught. <laughs> no, I was going somewhere. <laughs> they start their own label, Zeph Records, and release Tension in 2012. This includes their song, Fatty Boom Boom. Now, Garrett, did you watch the music video for that? I didn't. I watched the music video for Banana Brain. Okay. The music video for that prominently features Yolandi in just full blackface, hmm. followed by a cricket, or I guess they would call it a prawn gynecologist scene. And or What does that mean? A Lady Gaga stand-in goes to the gynecologist after she was in South Africa and her motorcade was taken over by uh, AK-47 wielding people. It turns out her gynecological problem is she has a cricket in her vagina. Aren't you glad you asked what that means? You said a cricket gynecologist. I was envisioning oh. a, 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 like <laughs> a Dr. Cricket. That's far better. It's probably best to steer clear of their music videos. Well, if you're going to try to dive into the pool of D-Antwoord, just hit the music video. Videos. They're like f four to seven minutes each. That way you don't have to waste a whole hour listening to one of these albums, because you shouldn't. They released their third album, Dunker Mag, in 2014. And then in September, they released the album of the week, Mount Ninji and the Nice Time Kid. I want to touch on a few things that, that you talked about here just for a moment before we move on. So you mentioned that they start Zeph Records. Do you happen to know what Zeph is a reference to? Yes, I've read quite a bit about this. Senor Ninja, the find Zeph as Afrikaans word that means 
the culture of low to lower middle class white South Africans. So he said it's it's associated with people who soup up their cars and rock gold and shit. Zeph is you're poor but you're fancy. You're poor but you're sexy. You've got style. Basically I think it's just mean South African version of white trash. That's where I started but then I, I did a lot of Google image searches for the Zeph style and while I do think that it is definitely geared more towards the lower socioeconomic bracket, I would argue that Zeph may very well be South Africa's Harajuku district. I think it's white trash Harajuku. Trash Harajuku. Yeah, this informs their entire look and style. Just utterly bizarre mishmash of like a torn tank top with like a $14,000 gold chain. So it still celebrates wealth and status symbols through material gains, as most rap music does here in America. But the difference is they also celebrate the fact that their car might not start. Uh, Tim, I really just fell into a rabbit hole this week. It's so weird. It's like looking in an alternate dimension. Because it's not the South African culture, by any means. Uh, I'm not pretending to be well steeped in it, but they are a weird subculture of South Africa that seems to want nothing more than to thumb their nose at authority in any way possible, whether that be They're... shaving off their eyebrows <laughs> or bizarre haircuts. The man really hates shaving off your eyebrows. I do too, because I'll tell you what, I don't know what it is, but for whatever reason, when I see somebody who's shaved off their eyebrows, it's not always immediately apparent to me what's wrong. Does this so come I, up a lot for you? More than I'd like. It's actually something you see around Austin, weirdly again more than i'd like every time i always begin with like oh what's what's going on there first i want to make sure that i don't start making any jokes that could be a thing th that they have <laughs> i haven't necessarily put my finger on what's wrong here i don't want to be insensitive and then i realize they've shaved their eyebrows off and that is an invitation to be mocked i like it that your initial concern is that it's a very specific alopecia no that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is I can tell something's wrong no. with their face. So you think it, you're worried that it might be a syndromic thing. Right. Let's talk in general terms. What do you think of this band? I don't want to overstate it. Obviously, that's not what we're about. We don't engage in hyperbole or say things to be shocking. I think no. we can both agree on that. Yeah, we're not here to make up asinine theories about who these people are. We're right. here for the facts. We employ a large team of people currently striking outside of this building. Uh, so if you do hear any smashing bottles or bizarre chants, that's what's happening. There is, what, what would you say, 35 people outside right now on the picket line? Something like that, yeah. You're right, Tim. That's not what we do. However, this album and this band make me want to reinstate apartheid solely so that the global community will have an excuse to impose sanctions and embargoes on South African products so that I never have to hear this. I think that's a fair trade, and I think the majority of the people in South Africa would agree with me. I gotta say, that is aggressive. <laughs> I have to believe that you have not thoroughly researched apartheid. I have. Uh, that's how much I, I hate uh, this so much. Can it be a Zeph apartheid? I feel as though the black communities of South Africa have struggled long enough that we need not impose a harsh minority controlled government upon these people once more, just for the sole reason of trying to keep D Antwoord out of your life personally. If that's what it takes. Wow. Troubling statement. Yes. This week, I have been living in a Black Mirror episode about the dystopian future of music. But it's the past. One would think. So in the Slipknot episode, we accuse them of sort of commodifying shock. They make several statements that that's what they're sort of trying to do. They say things like, people are unconscious, you have to use your art as a shock machine to wake them up. My point with this is that I'm not sure that that's actually what they're doing. I think I this think is, is just their cultural nonsense. And I, again, I don't mean South African nonsense. I mean Zeph culture. I have a cousin from Germany that whenever he was visiting us in the U.S., he would occasionally say something so excessively profane that I could see a little bit of my mom's soul die in her eyes just in casual <laughs> conversation just because that's... And that says a lot because she raised you 
Right. And he wasn't trying to do it. It was just that specific idea wasn't considered profane in Germany. Like how the word cunt makes people cringe in the US, but it's completely banal in like the UK or Australia. To some degree, I think that's what we're dealing with here. They're crazy nonsense. It's just, yeah, that's that's what we do. It's Tuesday. And everyone is sort of just like, Jesus Christ, that's bizarre. Okay, so I don't think your theory is crazy. And, and it is certainly informed by the facts. And I don't necessarily completely disagree, but I'm about to say some words that you're not going to like, okay? So just try to stay calm. This might be our generation's Andy Warhol. I don't disagree. Which is sad for us. I can't even attribute what they are to Zeph culture. I don't even think that's accurate. I can attribute what they are to the ant word culture. These are two art school kids that are just weird as all get out. We can admit this is a novelty act, right? Yeah, they're oh, just absolutely. this side of Tenacious D. Yeah. And, and sometimes they're on the same stage as Tenacious D. Right. I honestly believe that that what we're seeing is analogous to, say, a performance art piece that happens to be in electronic dance format, mostly. <laughs> and this is the root of why I don't hate this album. It's not for me. I don't like it. It drives me insane. They are 100% authentic to the art that they want to create. And I, I hate that I'm saying this. But I hate it. I just can't. I can draw a distinction for now. And, you know, occasionally, Tim, you are able to get me there. But I'm try and get you there. Uh, you know what? I tried to cut it off at the past by just saying it up front so that you didn't have to say it in your creepy, creepy. If you like. <laughs> and you just you knew you had to just you had to slip it in there. well here's Next the thing time. after i get you there mm -hmm. all i want to do is get you there again oh my God. okay you know what <laughs> stop it i know what you're doing it's obvious to all of us quit it. anyway i can't hate it and i can almost appreciate the amount of you know how hard it must be for them to do this to like live like this for years on end yes yeah publicly so in all the interviews i read they speak about the band and the people that they play in the band as characters oh absolutely they make no bones about it so um, they're just a living play my point is that i can't hate it because you have to take it all as an entire package a presentation of something new and alternative to your standard music it's it is a goof, essentially. And, you know, sometimes we have to theorize, is this a goof? But it, when we get into the song by song, I think it becomes even more clear that this is all sort of just a big joke. Yes, but I feel like it's a big joke specifically designed to anger me. Tim, you've got to let go of the idea that the <laughs> word was created solely to just piss you I off. I can't. If I were to go into a laboratory and grow two people, teach them how to make electronic dance music solely to piss you off, this is what I would create. But I promise you, no one grew these people in a lab. Again, we can't prove that. I do agree with what you're saying. We talked about how Wes Borland was an outlier in Limp Biscuit, the weird guy in the corner. And to me, this sort of seems like what would happen if you let that guy be the sole creative driving force in a band. And he also grew up in South Africa and this weird culture and English isn't his first language. Overall, though, this album sort of reminds me of Sgt. Pepper in a way. It seems like they wrote this huge rock opera or musical or concept album or something and then halfway through they kind of ditched that idea but they still kept a few of those songs in and then put other songs in that didn't really go with that theme and that's my biggest complaint about the whole album is if you had continually maintained the tone of the opening of this album with we have candy and daddy and of course banana brain god you love then, this band so much Hey, fucko. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if it at least remained consistent, I think that this album gets 40% better. But they completely scrap it halfway through, and it just kind of turns into boring rap. Anything else you want to say in the general thoughts? One other thing. If you have a poem that relates to any of this, we might not be friends anymore. I can say confidently, though I scoured the tome, I don't have a single <laughs> thing that even remotely resembles anything in here. That's good, because you know your father listens to this. And if you have a poem entitled Daddy, <laughs> oh my god, he might murder you. Let's get into the song by song. Track number one, We Have Candy. Do you think she's consciously or intentionally doing a gremlin voice? Yes. Okay. At least in this song. 
it does open with a bizarre gremlin voice. Okay, so this song opens like a skit. There's a doorbell. Somebody oh, sure. wants candy. Mm-hmm. But then another guy wants coffee. It's all very confusing. And then, yes. And, and then after that, you get this almost bohemian rhapsody type vocal. Nail on the head, Tim. This the, is the worst Queen song you've ever heard. Yeah. There's a big like orchestral chorus in this song for no apparent reason. This is the first one that really the only... I want to talk a little bit about a few of these lyrics here. Well, actually, you know what? Before I do, because I don't want to harp on this too much, I hate Yolandi's voice. Oh, yeah. And it's not her voice. So I was under the impression at the start of all of this that that was her actual voice. But as we'll learn later on in this album, she speaks like a normal person or can speak yes. like a normal person. So I think this might be her normal voice, but she can do an impression <laughs> of a normal person. That's my I, theory. I can't imagine that's the case. <laughs> I hope it's not for her sake and for everyone who has to speak to her on a daily basis. <laughs> There's a few things in here that I thought were weird. They offer a gentleman some coffee and they ask how he'd like his coffee. And he says he likes his coffee like his soul black is this a south park reference i think so they call kanye west kanye kardashian which yeah. is my favorite line of the whole thing yeah fuck that guy it. in the face he's not a genius <laughs> he is sort of a self-hating black man does that sound about right it's unclear it's, it no one knows what's going on there it is a potentially talented rapist struggling with the grips of severe mental illness uh, seek help kanye jesus christ There's also another line in here that I figure you're probably not terrifically familiar with, and I actually had to Google it because I only knew it sounded familiar. And then that is, uh, how do you feel now that you have your new dark powers? That is from Big Trouble in Little China. Not a great movie. I love it. If you were raised in the 80s by a television, you probably do too. Yeah. Not really worth your time nowadays, though. People love it. It Uh, seems like a huge cult classic. But I had a few disappointing events where I gathered several people who hadn't seen it together to watch it with me, only to realize that I loved it for nostalgia purposes and everybody else was like hey this is the worst kurt russell movie i've ever seen (laughs) there's also a reference to a movie that is legit funny tropic thunder do you hear that yep let's go full retard yeah not necessarily appropriate nowadays you probably couldn't get away with it although then again downey jr did blackface for an entire movie so i don't know what you can get away with sure and that was 2008 they do beastie boys references 50 cups of coffee and you know it's on super disco breaking ignoring the rest of the album if you can for a moment this song alone if every song was like this would you still hate this album yes just not gonna give me an inch are you no i can't i would probably hate it slightly less this is what was playing at acl whenever i first my ears were first were assaulted, assaulted by, by them this. yeah this high-pitched voice this rambling about nothing i don't want it there seems to be an eminem bully reference the last verse it's in the vocal delivery a lot of people have likened this to eminem's song bully as we discussed in the eminem episode we brought these guys up eminem felt the need to call them out on it and then they felt the need to make a youtube video calling him out on calling them out because that's what music is today apparently petty schoolyard arguments All right, let me ask you this question, Tim. Do you hate Eminem's latest album more or less than this album? Less. Damn it. Not me. That's fair. I would rather listen to this than Eminem's revival. That's fair. Need I remind you, at one point, he just plays the song Zombie by the Cranberries, although that's a good song. So. Yeah, <laughs> right. Fair enough. <laughs> this song also, and it has a lot of non-English lines, mostly sung in Afrikaans, or I guess that's yep, how you say it. That's right. That's fine. I have no problem with that. Translated, though, they're almost exclusively the dumbest lines on this album. And I, I was going to say, I understand why they put it in Afrikaans, because... Yeah. The, everything they say in that language is fucking stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens throughout many, many of the songs. They'll pepper in at first just a few lines or even just a couple of words. And then eventually an entire chorus is made up of the dumbest sentence in Afrikaans you've ever heard. Yeah. That moves us along to track number two, Daddy. Daddy, he play rough. And daddy likes next baby go do unusual stuff. Musically, this reminded me of Bubble Pop Electric. Yes. And lyrically, this is like the worst possible version of Janis Joplin's Mercedes Benz I've ever heard. <laughs> Every time. Certainly similar themes. I want to get to the core of this song immediately. Is the woman in this song, not talking about Yolandi, not talking about Henri, I'm talking about the girl in this song. Is she the daughter of daddy 
or is daddy a euphemism for the man she's banging? It's, I want to believe the second. Yeah, we all want to believe the second. I don't know if that's true. Because... It is muddy waters, yes, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. What you're referring to, there's all these lines, and I won't read the grossest of them, but... Thank you. Daddy, he liked to play rough, and daddy liked to make his girl do unusual stuff. It gets way worse, but there's also lines on here that's, yo baby, where's your ID, that sort of imply that this is at least a minor, which makes it more likely that it's his actual daughter. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's also the line, my daddy will fuck your daddy up, which is yeah. a common argument had with children on the school ground. I certainly remember debating whether or not my father would savagely beat another man. And I, to this day, I maintain he would win that fight. He's a terrifying man. Me. But yeah, that actually is my biggest complaint with this song. First of all, either way, honestly, I'm very upset because for the obvious reasons, if this is in fact his daughter, ew. Conversely, if daddy is a euphemism for a boyfriend or partner in today's parlance also gross right don't call people daddy and this has become i don't know if you're aware of this tim you're not the hippest cat on the street i apologize but we're speaking truth here daddy has become and it might have actually already fallen out of favor a word that would get used often on the twitters on the instagrams where grown ass women would call people daddy when they either found them attractive or thought that they were powerful or strong men and wanted to date them or in some way be associated with them and i just gotta say you. This also has this series of very rapid raps by Yolandi throughout this whole thing. And yep. whenever I first heard this, I thought it was fairly impressive. I kind of thought it was reminiscent of Eminem, how he spits out a whole bunch of multisyllabic words mm-hmm. in Possibly Fast. I agree. I don't think it is. I mean, whenever you actually dig into the lyrics of this and look at the words, it's not complicated at all. I'd like to see you do it. Okay. (laughs) Please don't do it. I'm absolutely going to do it. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Daddy, daddy, please buy me a sweet. I know you got money. I want that big chocolate bunny in my motherfucking tummy. Come on, daddy. Buy me that chocolate bunny. I know you got money. I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. You'll give it to me. Tim, I don't ever compliment you. For a number of reasons. One, you very rarely do anything worth complimenting. (laughs) Two, you have an ego that is wildly disproportionate to any skills or personality traits that you have. However, I am not a petty man. I can admit when I'm 100% wrong. And you, sir, fucking nailed it. Here's the thing, though. When Eminem does it, it's extremely complicated and genuinely difficult. This isn't difficult to do. It's no, all, not at it's all, very because simple. you just did it. It's very staccato things. It's, it's not difficult. And the reason why, it's a very simple rule. You never use H sounds. Wow. So I heard, Tim. I listened to a podcast. It was an NPR podcast. It was the Hamilton guy, Mark David Chapman or Lin-Manuel Miranda or whatever his name it's is. It's not the first thing. <laughs> And he said the secret to doing this, as he does in Hamilton, it's just you never use any H sounds because whenever you do, you release half your breath. If you don't do that, you can ramble on like this, essentially on one breath, endlessly. Tim, I'm so fucking impressed with you right now, and I hate it. I'm uncomfortable. I hate it more than I hate, more than you hate this album. It Untrue. makes me phys- no, it makes me physically ill to have to admit when I'm wrong and more importantly you're right. But I, I wouldn't cons- I want to hear Tim Antwoord. I want a- <laughs> I want a start to finish cover of this album. Guys, you know what? A couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week, I don't know. I can't tell time. I mentioned how important it is if you get on there on the iTunes and you rate, review, subscribe, it really helps us out. And I've started to already see a ton of Tim's a sucker on there. And that's been great. (laughs) If you didn't necessarily feel like you connected to Tim's a sucker, then hop on the old iTunes on the old review page and give us the five stars or whatever you feel appropriate probably five stars go with your gut and you want to just write tim antward rules <laughs> or tim antward or where's tim antward i like where's tim antward <laughs> but if you're short on time a simple tim antward would work and i'll know what it means you'll know what it means and what we'll be doing is laughing at tim i don't uh, think that's fair it, this isn't about fairness tim about laughing okay. at you the only other thing i we need to talk about on the song to top it off the jewel on the crown of a bad song we get oh, some spelling. i know where you're going l-a-m-b to the o classic way to identify that we picked the right album for this week we get 
our first instance, not our last, but our first instance of spelling in a song. As she is asking her daddy, unclear as to who that is, for various objects from an Easter chocolate bunny all the way up to a LAM B to the O Lambo, uh, which I feel like she escalated quickly. You know what, Tim? We've, we haven't touched on two things because you threw me through such a loop with that great rap. First of all, they do reference Cisco's inescapable thong song from the 2000s. Yes, they do. Uh, which made me giggle to no end. I still kind of hum that song whenever somebody brings it up. Uh, that thing just sneaks into your brain. And then the other thing is that I didn't know they were such pajama enthusiasts. Oh, yeah. She asks for some pajamas as she's slowly escalating from chocolate bunny to brand new car. And I did a little research, did some digging. They love a good pair of pajamas. Oh, yeah. They were talking a onesie here. Yes. Footy pajamas. And you know what? I didn't realize they made an assortment of adult sized footy pajamas, but somebody's Christmas present has already been bought. How did you know? Oh, I know you, friend. And I know that uh, you like to keep your head and your toes covered with the same piece of material. You misunderstood. I was asking, how did you know what I bought you for Christmas? It's going to be a good one this year. (laughs) And of course, as all of you are probably wondering, we do spend every Christmas together. Two grown men, our girlfriends, hate it. (laughs) Well. Uh, And exchange gifts solely to one another and nothing to them. Yes. Well, they have their own families. Right. They can go to them. Track number three, Garrett's favorite, Banana Brain. It is my favorite. This starts off sounding like Tron. <laughs> is that fair? It is. And the way I phrased it was, this is, the, this is the song where I actually realized, if you can believe it or not, that this is not really rap music. It's electronic dance music. It's a mixture, sure. So is this a love song? It begins with, ain't no one so sweet like you. Every time I think of you not by my side, I dry my eyes. I just want to sing lullabies to my little butterfly. Juicy, tushy, gushy goo. Booby one, booby two. Two. Bouncing like a Looney Tune, booty booming, cookie juice, gushing out of your coochie, boo. So, what is this? Let me break it down for you. This is the tale of a spiritual awakening of a conservative young lady turned out to the world by a street thug steeped in Zeph culture. As they attend a house party, she takes some acid and begins making out with ladies, and then it later devolves into some sort of dayglow paint strip slash lap dance. Uh, Not just by Yolandi to Ninji, but Ninji to also Yolandi as he points a gun at her repeatedly. Quite confusing. Go watch it afterwards. If there was actually one thing to watch that has anything to do with the ant word. If you don't know what this is, don't listen to the album, even though I don't hate it yet. Just go watch the Banana Brain uh, music video. That gets you 90% of the way there. <laughs> Basically, yes. So she's this conservative young lady that goes out to a house party with Ninji. Now, here's something interesting about Ninji. As he opens the door for Yolandi to go to the party, you find out that he has Oscar Pistorius legs. Wait, in real life? No. Oh. In the music video, oh. which is, to me, even stranger. <laughs> Yeah. I assume that the implication is that years from that date, he will accidentally, big quotey fingers there, depending on uh, where they are in the appeals process, accidentally shoot her several times, confusing her allegedly with a home invader or a woman he no longer wants to date. It depends on who you ask. How yeah, much I mean, money did they spend on that detail that I can almost guarantee no one else noticed? No, they had to have. They had no legs, man. <laughs> It's noticeable, trust me. Fair enough. I'll, uh... There's other special effects in that CGI and that music video as well. So I, I honestly don't know. It's like seven and a half minutes. It's a full story. It yeah. really takes you through it. The other interesting thing about this song, these guys just steal lyrics all willy-nilly from other people. The most yes. exa- obvious example in this is Mickey. Baby girl, mm-hmm. you so fine. So fine, so fine, you blow my mind. Is it okay to do that if you're rap? Like, can you just take lyrics? Mostly, yes. They changed okay. it just enough. So instead of, hey, Mickey, you get baby girl. Then you so fine. Then instead of you so fine, you blow my mind, you get so, so fine, you blow my mind. I would argue I mean, that. That should not be enough. <laughs> Legally, that's enough. But yes, it is. Hey, Mickey. Okay, so this is something unique to D Antwoord. They actually get praised for the fact that routinely they will re-release songs that they previously re- have released with a, a new arrangement. And a lot of their songs have subtle or no, 
not so subtle references to songs they've released. My argument is that this contributes to the idea that this is all just one big art project. What's interesting though is I found some weird home movies. These people are musically talented. Like there's one of Yolandi just playing the piano hmm. like a normal person. So they they know sort of what they're doing, kind of. I mean, arguably they've done it in the worst possible way. But I think, no, the different arrangements are like new beats, new sick beats, as you like to say. Yeah. Speaking of sick beats, the other thing we have to mention about this song is that part of the drum beat is sampled from somebody named Lynn Collins. And then there's another drum beat. And I'll tell you, it happens at 115 and 245 because I went down the rabbit hole on this one. Doesn't appear to be credited on this album, but it is the exact same sample Slipknot used at the beginning of Eyeless. This is Amen Brother by the Winstons. The song that I mentioned last week has been sampled by over 2,000 other songs, and that blew my mind. First of all, it's insane that two weeks in a row on albums that are this different sounding, we would get that exact same sample, and it goes to show that, yes, this is almost certainly in 2,000 plus songs. I 100% believe that now. And but, I'll give you a lot of credit. You were listening closely, because I didn't catch it at all at first till you told me to go back and re-listen to the song, and, and when, I, when I synced it up to... Synced it? Sunk? <laughs> can't be that sunk. can't be right. When I listen to that in the Winstons at the same time, you're spot on. It is 100% sampled from that. So apparently all music is in some way the Winstons. Yes. It's the equivalent of the Wilhelm scream being in just thousands yes. of movies. Somebody should do a podcast just looking at songs in which this sample appears. You would never run out of episodes. I'm not doing that though. This is our show. <laughs> this is our show. Congratulations <laughs> on remembering that. For better or worse, this is our show. Yeah, we're already locked into this life sentence. Track number four, shit just got real. This, of course, features Sendog. Most people know him from Cypress Hill. I know him as Garrett's freshman roommate. That guy was not tidy. You definitely can hear the Cypress Hill influence, which was kind of fun because I was a Cypress Hill fan as a kid because I had no taste of my own and would just follow what other those around me did. It's a little bit more circusy, I think, sounding than <laughs> Cypress Hill. And the other thing that was weird is there's a slide guitar in the background that yeah. gives it almost like a, it doesn't give it a country feel. I shouldn't say that, but it, it has that same, I mean, it is a country slide guitar part. A country element. Yes, yeah, sure. I thought that the sick beats in this, as you like to say, were at least unique. Now, granted, they were a bit circusy, <laughs> but I kind of enjoyed the fact that, like, I haven't really heard anything like this before. So many of these songs feature musical collaborations between God or DJ... High Tech? High Tech, sure. And other artists. The Black Goat is who he's collaborating with on this one. He does several of these other songs, and it's, it's kind of interesting. It seems strange that there's a rotation cast of people that are making all these songs basically for them to yell nonsense over but it makes sense because a lot of them have very different fields i want to talk a little bit about some lyrics in here if i may please because i have and nothing I, but questions and i quote everybody want to be a gangster so you want to be a gangster homes till it's time to do gangster shit these are arguably the least gangster people I've ever seen, right? Absolutely. One is a 90 pound girl and the other is an avant-garde artist, correct? <laughs> yes. Who I can confirm after hearing this album and watching way more interviews than I'd like, and he even touches on it, he is able to change his voice to mimic styles of music and how people speak. This is all largely contrived. He can speak like a very normal human being. So I'd like I, it if he I just can't... had a night job as uh, just a a bank teller it wouldn't shock me in the least if they hadn't have made it that's exactly what he'd be doing <laughs> or dead in, a, in an alley it just cracked me up that of all of the of all of the people in the world these these two are not gangsters later in the song when i'm zeph side i always roll strapped in a black mat scooby with a black mat gat subwoofer in the trunk kicking to the base now i got this fucking 38 sticking in my waist so i definitely believe these guys use the drugs they talk about that wouldn't surprise me well they really only only talk about two drugs they don't do any other drugs in fact i read several articles at least speaking about ninji can't speak for Henri or yolandi as she likes to be called can't speak for her 
But I know for a fact that Ninja does not do anything other than, you know, a little bit of ecstasy and smoke a lot of weed. But we can say for sure they're not out rolling with gats or shooting people. Well, okay, so here is the caveat. I don't know how steep you are in South African safety. Uh, There Uh, is none, right? (laughs) Correct. Okay. To give people a frame of reference, and this will be a fun game. Tim, how many people did you say on average are murdered in South Africa every day? Pick a real number. Don't be an asshole. 207. You are an asshole. It's not 207. I don't know. I don't know how many people live there. I don't... It's not Iraq in 2002. No, that's fair. You don't know how many people live there. It's 50. 50 people are murdered every day. So it's not the safest place in the world. From what I understand, haven't ever been there. If you don't have razor wire around your compound, aka house, you are going to have your shit taken. So I say all that because I think that it's entirely plausible that these folks are not unfamiliar with walking around with a gun. They could very well be used to walking around with a matte black 38 driving around in their Scooby, aka a Subaru WRX, which is not the height of luxury, but hey, (laughs) there's F. So it's not implausible to think that they're familiar with excessive violence because, you know, if you want to go get anything at the store, you're going to have to be faced by uh, roving bands of gunmen. But I do not think that that makes you a gangster. Okay. This was one of the songs that Genius Lyrics actually helped me out with. And it was kind of funny because Genius Lyrics actually replaced a lot of the lyrics with just question marks. And it's the first time I've ever seen that, (laughs) which made me laugh a lot. But there were people that annotated everything that translated from Afrikaans for us. Let me read to you a verse from this song in English. Hey, your mother's cunt. You're a fucking fucker. Fuck off. You're gonna die. Yes, you're gonna die. You're a mutt. I'm a big motherfucking dog. Hard dicks. Put them in your mouth. Speak, but you can't because there's a dick in your throat. The weird thing is, whenever you hear it in its native Afrikaans, it's beautiful. It doesn't sound bad in Afrikaans. (laughs) My new insult for anyone is, hey, dicks in your mouth. (laughs) Hard dicks. Put them inside of your mouth. Yeah, I think that the argument's over right there. Right, hard because dicks. there's a dick in your throat. Not, You know what? I'm not going to add any more context. I'm just going to say hard dicks in your mouth. <laughs> and walk away. Number five, Gucci Coochie featuring Dita Von Teese. This song sounds like it was named after a rejected Bond girl. Ian Fleming and Albert Broccoli were just, nope, that's too much. Two on the nose. Honestly, I think it is not. I think (laughs) Octopussy is slightly more on the nose than Gucci Gucci. In case folks at home listening are confused right now, you're sitting in traffic going, what's a Gucci Gucci? Let me explain, because I did some digging. Wish I had been on incognito mode, but (laughs) them's the breaks. A Gucci Gucci is a fancy vagina. (laughs) <laughs> now, Tim, I heard fancy pussy, but all right. Well, you know what? That's the difference between you and me. Uh, you're a crass, disgusting human being. And I, I like to think class. of it as Zeph. I am oh. Zeph. <laughs> you're Zeph? You're going full Zeph? That's right. Okay. Well, that explains some of what you're wearing. Um, <laughs> Tim, you're not necessarily an expert, but what makes a vagina fancy? Bedazzling. Mm, I thought so. So are we talking like charms or strictly glitter? Glitter seems unpleasant. Oh, it just gets everywhere, right? Yeah, There's no getting that glitter off. Right. Maybe that's the point. You don't want your glitter falling off. I mean, that's all I can think. Why is Dita Von Teese, first first of all, a professional burlesque dancer? That's not a thing. And burlesque second of all, dancer, why is she on here? model, and entrepreneur, first of all. No, fuck you. Her combination of lethal looks and taste for high-end fashion and luxuries serve as a warning to Ninja. Her Gucci Gucci, or as we discussed, fancy pussy, is a symbol of her sexual dominance over men. What does sexual dominance mean? Oh, Garrett. In this context, you oh. creep. Uh, Jesus, that was close, guys. You don't know how close we got to having to end this podcast. I don't know. Did you watch the teaser trailer they made for this song? No. Go watch it. Not now, but when you're done. And you're welcome in advance. Should I be in incognito mode? Oh, yeah. Good God, yes. It does, in fact, feature a Gucci Gucci. Yeah, more or less. They also have the lines in here, they peanut butter and jealous. They hate us because they ain't us. Is yes. that a reference to James yes. Franco? Okay, that's a reference to James Franco in the interview, the movie that didn't play in theaters because we were all collectively afraid that Kim Jong-un was going to murder all of us. Yeah, it was an odd time in geopolitical maneuvering. We didn't release a film in theaters for fear that North Korea would blow up Japan. <laughs> Makes sense. We definitely don't have our shit together now, but I still, looking back on that, don't fully understand what the State Department was doing. But yes, that's one 
100% ripped from that movie that apparently you, me, and eight other people saw. Something else that I noticed, just for me, there's the line, don't touch what you can't afford, which is delivered almost identically to Don't Stop Till You Get Enough by Michael Jackson. Hmm. Uh, every yeah, single time, I, that's all I heard. And then, as you mentioned, they talk about how jealous their neighbors are, and they switch between saying jealous and the Afrikaans word jalouche. I prefer jalouche. Absolutely. Tim, you're just jalouche of my Gucci Gucci. No. Maybe. Yes. Have you seen it? Is it bedazzled? You know uh, what? No. I don't care. I'd like to see it. Okay. I rescind the invitation to view my fancy vagina. Too late. All right. Track number six, Tim's favorite track, Wings on My Penis, featuring <laughs> Little Tommy Terror. This is not my favorite. Don't want to do this. All I want is wings on my motherfucking penis. Because no one will have ever heard this, we should really describe what's going on in Wings on My Penis. So, Little Tommy Terror is a six-year-old boy who wrote this song with Ninji, uh, who taught him how to rap. And, by, I mean, for all intent and purposes, he sounds like a six-year-old rapist. Unfortunately, the song is about how he likes to draw dicks on everything, which is based on a true story. He, much like Jonah Hill... Oh, in, had the same uh, what is thing. that? Uh, Superbad. Oh, yeah, so in Superbad, Jonah Hill enjoys drawing dicks on everything, and apparently so does Little Tommy Terror. Did you see who the music on this one was composed by? No. DJ Fuck. What? Yeah, DJ Fuck. Uh, you know, DJ okay. Fuck. There is a line in here that I actually really like. Well, let me rephrase. That at least sort of made me giggle. I don't want these Nikes. I don't want Adidas. All I want is wings on my motherfucking penis. <laughs> But aside from that, there's really not much to be said. I think it's like a 90-second song with a six-year-old rapping about dicks. That's like, true. It's fine. As long as this is a one-off, I'm completely okay with this. I will allow this to be on the album. We've done it. Let's move on to something different. I've got some really bad news for you about track seven. God damn it. Track number seven. You like boobies? What else is in that hole? Okay, check it. We go. For some reason, all rap or rap-adjacent albums have to have these weird skits on them. This should just have been left off the album, right? At best, it is a cautionary tale about being lured into various holes in pursuit of boobies and or ninjas. Yes. Which, it's unclear what kind of hole has boobies and ninjas in it. Rat holes, apparently. Right. And in this sentence, a rat hole is... I don't know. As she lures him in, she lists a bunch of things. She lists black people, candy, rats, rap music, ninjas, guns, aliens, and homosexuals to entice this child into said rat hole. Okay, yeah, I don't... Let's play a quick round of Jeopardy. Black people, candy, rats, rap music, ninjas, guns, aliens, homosexuals. What is the question? Go. What are things that will lure me into a rat hole? <laughs> Nailed it. Well done. Uh, nothing need to be said here. I think it's 45 seconds long. And as you mentioned, it's just this lady trying to lure a young boy into a hole with the promise of boobies and homosexuals. Track number eight, Rats Rule, featuring completely confusingly Jack Black. Rats, rats, everywhere you look, everywhere you turn. This rats. starts out like a Doors song. Precisely. Full organ, that alone would be a very strange opening to this song. However, it only gets weirder from there. Yeah, it continues the feel that this was originally intended to be a musical. Like, mm -hmm. I can completely see Jack Black doing this on stage. He's got a top hat, some sort of cape, a monocle, a cane, and he's doing like a carnival barker thing with the uh, rats, rats, everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, there's rats. I pictured him still with the top hat, almost like a chimney sweep, but... Okay. A custodian, um, maybe in a large factory. Let's call it a cracker factory. Yeah. And as everyone goes home every night, he, the rat king, uh, must lure the rats into so that they don't eat all the crackers. But I know this, what we're saying sounds insane, folks, but it fits so well it's insane this belongs in the opening to a terrible broadway production and it is near the end of the fun weird stuff let me read you the genius lyrics explanation for this song so i want to read you the only line in this that actually made me laugh towards the end i guess of the song i believe it is what was his name on uh, the dick song tommy terror i believe little tommy terror's mother is actually on this and she doesn't rap doesn't sing you hear a woman just go no cut it out there's a rat in my ass there's a rat in my ass oh my god <laughs> i mean you know what out of context in context doesn't really matter that's ridiculous <laughs> yeah that's in a song guys there's a woman screaming about a rat in her butt as you do when there's a rat in your butt oh yeah no i would make quite a racket i assume <laughs> 
<laughs> so much authority. You ready to move on? Yeah. Number nine, Jonah Hill. So they clearly were watching Super Bad when they wrote this album. Yes. This is like the third or fourth, or, or they're huge fans of the Jonah Hill. Yeah, James what is Franco, name? Seth Rogen. That yeah, thing. all of those movies, because it's just chock full of references to these guys. Now, granted, this song has nothing to do with Jonah Hill. No. This, this is the song where you learn that Yolandi can speak like a normal human being. Right? Yeah. I guess I'll read the lines. Folks, strap in. This is not pleasant. Your boy ninja got skill like deep throat. There's cum squirting out your nostrils. The track stops. <laughs> Yolande, and we hear Yolandi in her real voice. So I guess in this instance, she's Henri. And she says, hey, that sounds pretty gay. Now, she's not persecuting him for, for being gay. Her concern is that this is just going to be confusing to the listener. And it was. Because it's super confusing. I'm glad she called it out. And then they ask God, aka DJ High Tech, whether or not it sounded gay, because he is gay, and he would know whether or not it sounded gay. Yeah. And then the song ends. <laughs> that interruption, though, I I found it just kind of off-putting mostly because like it's just so clearly scripted it kind of feels like they didn't think of a second verse or couldn't figure out a good rhyme scheme for the second half so they just made a little skit and tacked it on yes now i will compliment it though because there is not a six-year-old singing about dicks see but that's a super low bar like that shouldn't be we have low bars on this show for things we will compliment that's that's too low yeah that is pretty low <laughs> I'm getting a little nervous here, Tim. I feel I started this album not hating it. But as you pointed out, I've I've set a fairly low bar and we're so far away I can't even see Banana Brain anymore. <laughs> and it's only going to get worse from here. Song number 10, Stupid Rich. The genius annotations, it says, Stupid Rich is a celebration of material wealth and all of the success D. Antword have had in the past few years. The word is deliberately misspelled to emphasize the ludicrous level of wealth they have accrued. Now, in this explanation, emphasize is misspelled, and it's unclear what that was intended to emphasize. That they don't know how to spell. Oh. That they are poorly educated. Fair enough. This is just the most conventional rap song on this album, right? It's my least favorite song. Yeah. It's basically basically just everything we dislike about rap songs. It's just the bragging about how much money you have, essentially. And it's kind of done in a more traditional trap music, slowed down, not not chopped and screwed, just a more traditional slowed down like uh, Wiz Khalifa, maybe. Honestly, if they'd created an entire album of just this, it might have been w way more successful. I would have had a lot less fun with it. The lyrics here, big house on the hill, in amongst the trees... I got anything you want, anything you need. When they see how I'm living, they go, oh my God. This just has all the artistic merit of an episode of MTV Cribs. Here's some cool shit I got that you don't. Right. While we're on the subject, that's MTV Cribs, CMT Cribs, and uh, Teen Cribs. Now available on Snapchat Discover. MTV Cribs, welcome to my crib. Tim? It, contractual obligation, I apologize. Could no. you expound upon that con contractual obligation? I will not. I didn't sign any contracts. No, yeah, I know you didn't. They were very clear. I can't say who, though. The only... I, go ahead. You have to split the money with me, you cunt. The only thing I will say that is kind of semi-refreshing about this is that at least they aren't bitching about what a hassle it is to have all the money. No, they are legitimately pleased with their success. But just returning for a moment, <laughs> are you sponsored by MTV or Snapchat? I'm not sponsored by MTV or Snapchat. Are you sponsored by either of their parent corporations? Technically, no. I guess... I feel like I, I just haven't figured out the right magical have... word for <laughs> yeah. you to admit the fact that you're making money off this podcast and not giving any to me? Yeah, you said or, not and. Song number 11, Fat Faded Fuckface. I don't particularly like this song, but it's a hard enough left turn from the previous into self-deprecation territory that it's kind of pleasant in comparison. Yeah, I guess. It's still just so conventional in yeah. the raps that I, I just don't care. I am listening to D'Antward to be blown away, to be completely befuddled as to what in the world these Zeph freaks are up to. This just feels like something I could hear on any rap station. Now, you say that, but did you translate verse 2 into English? No. Go oh. ahead. Your mama 
is a meth head. I'll beat yo mama up. Your mama talks shit. Your mother is a whore. Your mother fucks everyone in the club. Your mother has AIDS. And again, beautiful in their language. Right, but not so great in English. Building upon that, there was a line in here that's in the <laughs> chorus. And that line is, something crawled up your anus and died. That's why your face is so fucked up. <laughs> I mean, granted, I probably would be making a very peculiar face if there was something dead in my butt. Again, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been there. Worse don't if it's alive, there. right? Yeah, probably. Alive and can't find its way out. (laughs) Anyway, let alone to just be a ridiculous throwaway line, the fact that it's part of the chorus and gets repeated throughout every time, I was just like, wait a minute. First of all, the use of the word anus is hysterical. (laughs) Yeah, Um, it doesn't really seem to be their style. And then the idea that because it died, that's why your face is fucked (laughs) up. And I don't know if they actually meant it as a joke. I think it was a legitimate insult. All right, let's move this crazy train along. Track number 12, peanut butter plus jelly. This is an interesting rap song only from the standpoint that a grown man is bragging about his onesie and also an itchy and scratchy tracksuit, which I saw a photo of, and it's pretty awesome. (laughs) I've heard rap songs about encounters with gentlemen who don't share your worldview in the club before. I believe you have as well. Oh, yeah, I know where you're going with this, and and I'm going to let you finish, but I do want to say it's a real Garrett move. It is. It absolutely is. I have never heard a rap song that instead of fighting ends with somebody taking a phone, rubbing it on his penis, and then casually handing it back to the individual. Yeah, so to set the stage, this guy is up in Ninji's face. He clearly wants to fight him. He snatches his phone out of his hand, sticks it down his pants, rubs it all around, and then tries to hand it back to him. And the guy is understandably upset. (laughs) But that is a power move, the likes of which nobody's prepared for. Yeah, it's pretty strong. And there's also the reason I say it's a Garrett move is that for years and years, I had a good friend. Well, a friend. You didn't like that. (laughs) You never liked that guy. Anyway, for years, I he drove me crazy because he would always want to shake my hand when I saw him. And I saw him every day. And I don't know about you guys, but when I see a friend every day, particularly in college, I wasn't prone to shake their hand. Absolutely not. You go with a hug. Uh, If you're Tim, he is going to try to hug you. But my point is that to try to get him to stop, what I would begin doing is as he would walk towards me, I would immediately stick my hand down the front of my pants in the most obvious gesture humanly possible to make it very clear, hey, my hand is in my pants. I live in Texas. That's not a fun place to be right now. And then he would offer to shake my hand. Mid handshake, while I gripped tightly, I would remind him, hey, buddy, didn't you just see where that hand was? This went on for two years. (laughs) So either he really likes the smell of my crotch on his hand, or he's the least observant human being on the planet. True. And also, you're a monster. I, I... Listen, it's not my fault that he didn't get it. If I had done that to you once, after you got done punching me in the face, you would have always looked at where my hands were. Maybe that's why I always go with a hug. You ever think about that? No, I know why you always go for a hug. You are the only person I know that hugs with his pelvis. (laughs) This is the third song in a row, Tim, where I feel my ability to defend this album withering. I'm not there yet, but I am close to there. Yeah, and I'm going to take you the rest of the way. I am gonna get you there all right we better go fast and furious then i don't want to lose it <laughs> you know what i don't you're right you're right it's a bad metaphor it is uh gross yes <laughs> track number 13 alien i call the opening verse to this the ballad of tim that's rude. I think it fits you hey, You don't better. even know what I'm going to say. I do know exactly what you're going to say, but go on. You don't know. It could be very nice. So I'm going to read the opening lines. I am an alien. No matter how hard I try, I don't fit in. Always on my own, sad and lonely. All I want is for someone to play with me. Does that not sound like you? No, it sounds like your childhood. However, these whack copycat ball bags can suck my motherfucking dick. Is that not you? Oh, that's me. Yeah, I say that's, that all the okay. time. That she actually yeah, well, might have overheard me say that at AC. I don't feel like we get to whack copycat ball bags without a little bit. No matter how hard I try, I don't fit in. Maybe because you're calling everybody a ball bag. <laughs> <laughs> that's no way to make friends. Oh. I thought you were kidding, so I stuck around. But now that I 
realized you were serious. It's just too late for me to find any other friends. That's it's been too late for a while. Rude. I mean, there's some late breaking news with this song. Do you know what it is? No. Yesterday, as we record this, and folks, when we record it, tough to say. But as of yesterday, they just announced a new music video for this song is coming out soon. I assume I'll never see it. Probably not. It looked neat. It actually looked kind of like a Neil Blomkamp movie. Yeah, but I saw a Neil Blomkamp movie that had them in it. That's fair. And yeah, and that wasn't good. Yeah. So you had the weirdness, then you have them break into conventional rap, and then you get this. This is different. This is lullaby music, and then mm-hmm. Yanni, or whatever her name is, her creepy voice, with these genuinely kind of confessional lyrics about not fitting in, having a rough childhood, etc. And mm-hmm. I did not expect this one at all. This continues for the next couple of songs, I think. For at least, yeah, two more. Yeah. You get, it becomes, I mean, she's singing, right? It's still in that weird high-pitched tone, but she is singing, so it sounds a little less odd. Well, specifically with starting out the line, I am an alien, or, or I am a alien, which drove me crazy that actually seems to fit the high-pitched voice it sort of makes sense for her to be singing in that voice on this song i don't like it more so than any of the others sure it is at least a voice for singing as opposed to a voice for speaking did you catch the kurt cobain quote i did yeah boy nothing gets past you they laugh at me because i'm different i laugh at them because they're all the same yeah apparently the band feels very influenced by nirvana did you not hear that in the banana brain i didn't quite get the nirvana vibe from banana (laughs) brain no maybe it's just the pajamas I could see Kurt Cobain rocking a onesie. I think you're confusing the fact that he definitely slept in the clothes he was wearing. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't know if you get to call it sleeping when it's a nod. One wore the clothes that you ought to wear to bed out, and another wore to bed the clothes that one would wear out. The difference being that Kurt Cobain just didn't change because he was a stinky heroin addict. Whom I love, by the way. Like, I love fucking Nirvana, but let's be honest. He was addicted to heroin. (laughs) <laughs> I don't, no, I don't think no denying that, folks. <laughs> All right, let's move it along, right? Yeah. Track number 14, Streetlight. This is the song, I think, that clashes most directly with the beginning of this album. It seems to be a genuinely serious song about violence. Yes, the reason that it clashes so much is it's the most authentic song to them, their lives, and where they live and how they grew up than anything else in here. Yeah, I mean, it it still has the bragging on it. It seems like... Well, because they don't get killed? Yeah, and he seems to have beaten the shit out of, like, six raddies i was actually trying to figure it out so the song is about a they're for some reason hanging out in the dark streets of johannesburg or cape town it's unclear at night which you don't do and a group of street toughs or rowdy teens raddies with okay raddies as they put it and as tim insists on putting it and what i fear will be a term that i'm going to have to endure for many years now (laughs) yeah it's a part of our lives anyway they roll up as the kids say with a gun they grab Yolandi. He, she's fighting, kicking, and screaming. They're worried for their lives, but the guys don't actually shoot anything. Turns out the gun doesn't have any bullets in it. So I actually think this is, a once again, a very authentic tale of what happens. So what you have to understand about South Africa is the level of poverty is such that that's why there's so much violence. Unlike America, where people just want shit. There, people want to eat. There, people literally need money for food. And so life means very little to, to these people when they're just trying to support themselves. However, Oftentimes, a lot of these these criminals can't even afford bullets. So they'll go around and just try to stage, essentially, a stick-up because they, they're just trying to fool you into giving them the, your wallet. Perhaps that is their performance art. <laughs> I don't think so, man. I think it's just extreme poverty on a level that we're headed face-first into. Oh, good. Can I sum this song up with the genius description? What better way, right? After the tragic events that took place in this song, D. Antwoord has had a change of heart about their verbiage. Fucking your bitch is okay. Rape is not. I don't even know. What? What does that mean? Okay, hold on. (laughs) So after the fictitious events of the song that these two wrote. Yes. They then decided, not previously, not innately, and not for their whole lives, that it turns out rape's not okay. Yes, but fucking your bitch is. Well, I'm not here to say you can't fuck your bitch. (laughs) 
But I think we all can agree, no matter whether or not you've been accosted on the streets of Johannesburg, rape's not okay. It didn't take a song that these two wrote themselves about fictitious events and characters to then come to that conclusion. All right, let's move it along. All right, number 15, Darkling. This is the same song as Alien. Yes, only it's a prequel. It's a song about Yolande being adopted and not being wanted by her mother and not knowing her father. But aside from that, I don't want to say another thing about it. Track 16, I Don't Care. Which again, continues the trend from last week of this last song being sort of perfectly titled. I don't care. Were you able to ascertain what this song is an adaptation of? Yes, but I don't know how to say it. It is a classic Russian song, which if you've ever seen a crappy movie, crappy comedy more than likely, that then cuts like smash cut to Russia and you get an establishing shot of the Kremlin, the music that is playing to let you know this is Russia is this song. Yeah, it's not a classic Russian song. It is a classic Soviet song. I fail to see the distinction. That's more political than I would like to get into today. <laughs> well, Somebody's done, trying to avoid being assassinated by Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Are you not? I am antagonizing the shit out of him. Bring it, Pootie. Okay. He does not speak for the podcast. Good I God. I do speak for the podcast. No. Until I start seeing that fucking money, that <laughs> Viacom money, I'm going to keep antagonizing the Russian government and putting <laughs> your name on it. That's not fair. Don't do that. Good God. And this is a fairly simple lullaby. The weird thing about it is that they, do this building techno beat for some reason yes to just an all-out what i can only describe as laser noises they are laser noises you know it's hard to say that a laser makes a noise but yeah that is a laser noise (laughs) yeah and then you get dj god dj well we learn in this song that god is a dj and that he loves you and that's to the people of earth don't know if either of those facts are true oh they are read your bible read your bible i did that's how i'm so confident right now did you not get to the the turntablist part of the bible no is that i might be able to turn you around on this whole bible thing (laughs) and jedediah said to the corinthians make sweet beats (laughs) (laughs) yeah they actually write in the record scratches it's pretty impressive yeah what how do you spell a record scratch in Aramaic? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Ironically, because track number 16 is a big fat, I don't care. I want to do a quick recap here because this is going to come into play when I make my final decision at the end of this episode. So I don't care. Darkling. Streetlight. Alien, I guess. Peanut butter plus jelly. Oh boy. Fat faded fuck face. <laughs> And Stupid Rich. Well, you know, Jonah Hill's not great either. Yeah, and you gotta add that second terrible Tommy Timaru or whatever his name is. The skit one. That's terrible. And um, I'd like to nominate all the other songs. No, no. You're losing your objectivity. (laughs) This is not an objective show. But okay. Uh, You know... So I was so blinded by Banana Brain that well, yeah, I don't want I don't want to spoil I don't want to spoil anything. Well, but that to, is nine songs that I do not care for. On okay, this album. so nine bad to seven. What you're calling good? Mm, good for this album. Nine songs much. that are bad to seven songs that Garrett loves. That is that's where at, at that's all. where we're at right now. Let's talk about how this album performed. Easily the least impressive album sales-wise of any album we've done, right? I don't know. It's very hard to tell. Well, that's kind of what makes me think that. It probably is, but I couldn't get any hard numbers on this. And again, research team is currently attempting to unionize, so... Why don't you hit us with some of the numbers you could find? So this hit number 32 on the Billboard 200, but it did not... was 34. I wrote down 32. We need the goddamn boys at the lab. It hit either 32 or 34 on the Billboard 200. One week. Right. One week. It did reach number one on the U.S. dance and electronic charts and number two on the indie charts. It was the fourth best-selling dance and electronic album of 2016. I don't know what that means. I don't know how good that is. The only other number that I could come up with is that it sold 11,000 copies the week it came out 
out and that was the best week they've ever had. Those are like our podcast numbers. So <laughs> that's not great. That's that pretty good great. for us though. Oh no, it's great for us. What did the reviewers have to say? It's got a 55% on Metacritic, their review aggregator. It got two out of five on Guardian and then Drowned in Sound. They gave it the best that I could find anywhere. Eight out of ten. Let's get to the important stuff. What did the rank and file, the man on the street, have to say about this album? Most people seem not to give a shit because there were only 78 total reviews on Amazon. But 83% gave it four to five stars. That comes out to A minus, I guess. Yeah. This band is like a cult classic. Yes, There's not a lot of fans, but those who are are ardent. Every single one of the one-star reviews were because the vinyl was defective or the person shipping it to them did a shitty job. (laughs) That's amazing. Mm. So this could be much closer to five stars. Yeah. And most of the positive reviews, unfortunately, were things along the lines of legit, yo. So technically, that's the first review because that's all there was. Let's get into a couple of their actual substantial reviews here. The first one is entitled Different eclectic crazy awesome not for everyone however everyone must check out all of their stuff at least once to see if it is for them you just might surprise yourself if you're willing to admit it a combination of rap edm hip-hop with a south african twist they're at least trying to do something a little different and that alone is worth some points great stuff Mm. a must watch in concert more power to them you and this person could not be friends (laughs) do you find yourself while listening to them do you find yourself wanting to be their friend yes Okay, that's not how I thought that was going to go at all. Okay. I want to meet them. I want to know what in the world is... I want to know, are you right or am I right? Some of the references they make are things I enjoy. I, If I were making a, an electronic dance music album with some hip-hop elements, I would totally reference Cisco's Thong Song. Okay. I probably wouldn't have a six-year-old singing about dicks. That seems ill-advised, but... See, that's what I would do. And that's why this podcast works, Tim. We're (laughs) two sides of the same coin. Next review by Lucifer Al. Lucifer. That's a great name. Yeah. God is a DJ and he loves you. The apotheosis of super whack electronic hip hop rave masters D Antwords fourth and final album arrived in vinyl format just four months ago. On it, you'll find collabs with Send Dog of Cypress Hill. Yeah, shit just got real, boy. And burlesque superstar Dita Von Teese, as well as Jack Black on the laid back track Rats. Not only is the entire album a superlative work of pure ear candy, but we're talking about a progressive hip-hop electronic attack on the senses that I find virtually unprecedented. You could almost call this a concept album, albeit a loosely themed one, but it's enough for the attentive listener to tie together all the disparate threads which members Yolandi Visser and Ninja, along with their producer DJ Hightech, aka God, have woven into an unmistakable masterpiece of serious, narrative-driven post-electronica. And then he goes on for five more paragraphs that are at at least as God. long as that one. Jesus Christ. <sighs> Some people should not smoke pot. <laughs> Good lord. (laughs) Once again, you've managed to find a review that hits on a lot of the things you and I have discussed and comes to the complete opposite conclusion. So good for him, I guess. So we know what the critics think. We know what the average idiot thinks. Before we get to the final question, let's ask almost an equally important one. Who is this album for? This is for people of a dystopian future to listen to in the rare breaks they're allowed in between fighting brutal killing machines of Amazon and Apple atop Mm -hmm. a pile of human bones. That sounds pretty accurate. Also, I should also add, people on lots of MDMA in our current human-led society. Okay, so that's exactly where I was going to go with this. So prior to the robot apocalypse, I would say that the modern listener is either someone that is so incredibly high that they just giggle through all of this, or so incredibly fucked up on ecstasy that they just have to dance. But seriously, three years tops, start stockpiling chainsaws, because robots are coming, and you're going to have to listen to D-Antwoord. That's true. I've told you repeatedly, of all of the weapons you 
could compile to fight the robot armies, Chainsaw is not the way to go. I like the up-close-and-personal touch when dealing with a robot or computer of any sort. You know what? We don't have time for me to get into this, <laughs> but we're going to talk about it afterwards because I, your life depends on it. Uh, also, I think I understand why you keep going through computers. Final thoughts. This music, it hurts my brain. I don't get it, and I don't want it. My biggest issue with this album, now that we've really dug into it, is the lack of consistency. I can handle ridiculousness, or I can handle self-serious rap music. I cannot handle both on the same thing. And I was all willing to get on board. They had me at Banana Brain. And they might have even had me at We Have Candy. But <laughs> You love that daddy, the, too. Don't forget about daddy. That makes me sick. <laughs> I don't want to drag this out anymore. I, I don't even really have to ask it, but for the sake of formality, I must. Do you hate this album? So very much. I hate this enough that I will never be able to look at you the same way again. And that's by that I mean without murder in my eyes. But more importantly, and more interestingly, what about you? Did we get you there? Do you hate this album? Please tell me I got you there. As difficult as this is going to be to say, you did in fact get me there. Excellent. Excellent. I am there. You hear that, folks? I am there. I hate this album. Good. I don't think I hate it for the same reason as you. That's fine. Don't care. All right. <laughs> Nine of the 16 songs I flat out don't like. Can we throw Daddy in there? Because I feel like you're not including Daddy. I'm going to leave it because it's ambiguous. I don't know. I can't cast dispersions okay. without somebody clarifying So it. it doesn't make you sick. You kind of like it. No. You're willing to like it. No. Okay, I, so... You're so in, fucking binary. In what scenario would it be acceptable? Because we discussed if it's about uh, a man and his daughter on some sort of horrifying vacation, that's bad. Not that. Not and that. if it's about a girlfriend who enjoys calling her boyfriend daddy, that's bad. So what's the yeah. third scenario in which we're not putting that in the category of songs you don't like? As long as it's not a song about pedophilia, I'm okay. A <laughs> little bit of housekeeping. As always, we mentioned the rate review subscribe it helps us out big time and we really do appreciate it you guys have been doing a great job thank you very much i want to hit on this again we've gotten a few uh we get a lot of great emails requesting albums and guys we add them to the list hatepod.com there's a contact us form there up upper left hand corner we answer your questions and we if you have comments about the show we love to hear from them you can also write in to hatepodmail at gmail.com uh, let us know what you think additionally we've gotten a few but not that many uh if you guys have stories anecdotes hilarious things that happen related to any of these albums let us know we uh, we'd love to put them together and do a viewer mail episode we, we will keep things anonymous so that just first names only and feel free to write in with a fake first name we don't mind uh, i've been using one for this entire podcast yeah tim's name is gordon ebersley <laughs> do not write in referring to me as gordon ebersley i don't care for it <laughs> Oh, so few people are probably listening at this point. Gordon My is a whole... sucker. <laughs> right in, Gordon is a sucker. <laughs> no, no, no. You're not getting out of this. Tim is a sucker is the phrase. That way you know. If you want to make reference to Tim secretly being Gordon Eversley, feel, feel free. God, that's funny. All right. This has been Why I Hate This Album. I am Garrett Harvey, one of your hosts. I'm Tim Richardson, the other one. The riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense. All the songs are B-sides and the cover art's a mess. There's so much here to tear apart. Listen to it for a week, now that we has passed. It's why I hate this album podcast with Tim and Garrett.